This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. Good morning, I'm John Trout. It's Tuesday, July 16th, 2024. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. Donald Trump makes a dramatic appearance on the first night of the Republican convention. Please welcome Donald J. Trump. I'm Steve Futterman in Milwaukee. Investigators continue to search for a motive in the Trump assassination attempt. I'm John Stolness in Washington. Another legal victory for former President Donald Trump. We have one set of laws in this country, and they apply to everyone. I'm Clayton Neville. A South Dakota judge rules on whether his state's voters can decide on the abortion issue. We'll have the ruling. The Dow opens at a new record high this morning, and shares of gun makers soared after the failed Trump assassination attempt. I'm Jessica Ettinger. An Alaska man going to jail for over 200 years. The existence of lunar caves on the moon has been a mystery for over 50 years, but now the mystery has been solved. I'm Sue Aller. All ahead on America in the Morning. This is day number two of the Republican National Convention. In day one, delegates in Wisconsin officially nominated Donald Trump and the presidential nominee announced his running mate. A recap from our Steve Futterman reporting from the RNC in Milwaukee. Two days after he was shot in the ear, Donald Trump, his ear bandaged, made his first public appearance. Ladies and gentlemen, the 45th president of the United States and soon to be the 47th president of the United States, please welcome Donald J. Trump. Not surprisingly, he was greeted with massive cheers from the Republican delegates. At one point, they chanted, we love Trump. Earlier in the day, Trump formally received the GOP nomination. His son, Eric, part of the Florida delegation, announced the votes that put him over the top. On behalf of our entire family and on behalf of the 125 delegates in the unbelievable state of Florida, we hereby nominate every single one of them for the greatest president that's ever lived, and that's Donald J. Trump, hereby declaring him the Republican nominee for President of the United States of America. The biggest news here yesterday came when the former president announced that Ohio Senator J.D. Vance will be his running mate. On Fox News, Vance talked about the phone call from Trump. You know, he, he just said, look, uh, I think we're going to go save this country. Uh, I think you're the guy who can help me in the, in, in the best way. You can help me govern. You can help me win. You the speakers last night made various references to the weekend shooting Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. The devil came to Pennsylvania holding a rifle. But an American lion got back up on his feet and he roared! One of the most potentially significant speeches came from the Teamsters President Sean O'Brien. He didn't endorse Trump. I want to be clear. At the end of the day, the Teamsters are not interested if you have a D, R, or an I next to your name. We want to know one thing. What are you doing to help American workers? In fact, the Teamsters haven't endorsed a Republican presidential candidate in decades, but his appearance showed a certain comfort level with the GOP. There were, of course, plenty of attacks on President Biden, Alabama Senator Katie Britt. Four more years of Biden-Harris will impose a lifetime of financial damage on our children and our nation. Tonight, the focus of day two will be safety in America. A hot topic will certainly be the U.S.-Mexico border. I'm Steve Futterman at the Republican Convention in Milwaukee. Two days after a gunman tried to assassinate President Donald Trump, authorities are still trying to figure out what could have motivated the 20-year-old would-be assassin. John Stolness is following the latest. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas says they will be conducting an independent investigation into the assassination attempt on the Republican nominee for president. The Secret Service has taken criticism from some after the gunman, Thomas Matthew Crooks, was able to ascend to an adjacent rooftop with a clear line of sight of the president. But at yesterday's White House briefing, Secretary Mayorkas said he's still confident in the agency. I have 100 percent confidence in the director of the United States State Secret Service. I have 100 percent confidence in the United States Secret Service. In an interview with ABC News, Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheadle takes responsibility for what happened. The Secret Service is responsible for the protection of the former president. So the buck stops with you? The buck stops with me. I am the director of the Secret Service. It was unacceptable. 
and it's something that shouldn't happen again. And says she's grateful for Mayorkas' support. I appreciate the secretary's comments, and we're going to continue to be transparent uh, and communicate with people. Do you plan to stay on? Absolutely. I do plan to stay on. Republican chairman of the House Oversight Committee, James Comer, is requesting Cheadle hand over a ream of documents and communications regarding the Trump shooting and that she will testify before the committee next Monday. Reports indicate local police were being used by the Secret Service to patrol the outer edges of the security zone Saturday and that there were local police officers inside the building that was used for the shooting. As for motive, police have finished searching his home and car and come up with nothing, noting he also did not appear to have a social media footprint. Liam Campbell, a neighbor of Crooks, says the gunman almost exclusively stayed to himself. He sat by himself, didn't talk to anyone, like didn't even try to make conversation. So it was just kind of odd. Um, he was an odd kid. NBC News reports local police notified the Secret Service they were looking for a suspicious person in the area shortly before the shooting. More than a dozen guns were found in his family's home, and federal officials say Crooks bought 50 rounds of ammunition the day of the shooting. John Stolness, Washington. When we return on America in the Morning, Trump court case thrown out after these messages. This is America in the Morning. Welcome back at the National Map. AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy has today's forecast. An expansive storm system extending from the Great Lakes through the Northeast will be producing heavy, gusty thunderstorms out ahead of it even early this morning through portions of Illinois and Indiana. These storms have already had a history of producing gusts over 90 miles per hour and even a tornado. The main concern today will be over southern Illinois into southern Indiana and Ohio before continuing into northern Kentucky this afternoon and eastward to western Pennsylvania and central New York. These storms will still produce damaging winds, hail, flash flooding, and even an isolated tornado. Few scattered thunderstorms will form farther west along the same system through portions of northern Missouri into Nebraska and Kansas, a few of which could become gusty. And then we'll have another area of heavier storms developing along the front range of the Rockies from Wyoming into Colorado and then expand into parts of western Nebraska and Kansas late today and tonight. These storms could contain gusty winds and cause flash flooding. Out ahead of the system, it is going to be hot and humid once again. We'll see 90s and 100s from the southern plains into the southeast and continuing into the Tennessee Valley, Middle Atlantic, and the coastal northeast. AccuWeather real field temperatures could be close to 110. Some relief may be felt in the southeast where scattered afternoon thunderstorms could lead to briefly cooler conditions. The real relief will be in the northern plains in the wake of this frontal system where a much more comfortable weather will be moving in with lower humidity and lower temperatures. That's the weather across America. Indianapolis, Indiana will have plenty of clouds along with some heavier showers and thunderstorms today with a high of 86. It'll be a seasonably hot day in Reno, Nevada with plenty of sunshine and a high of 95. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. Days after he dodged a bullet during a campaign rally in Pennsylvania, former President Trump is catching a break in the federal classified documents case against him. Correspondent Clayton Neville reports. Federal Judge Eileen Cannon dismissing the case against former President Trump. He was facing federal charges for allegedly having classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago residence. Charges were brought by DOJ Special Counsel Jack Smith. Charges Trump denied. Adherence to the rule of law is a bedrock principle of the Department of Justice. And our nation's commitment to the rule of law sets an example for the world. We have one set of laws in this country and they apply to everyone. But this week, Judge Cannon issued a 93-page opinion dismissing the case on the grounds that the appointment of Jack Smith was unconstitutional. She specifically said that Congress wasn't involved in the appointment, making it unlawful. Congressman James Comer spoke with Fox News about the case being dismissed. All these uh, cases that I considered legal warfare against Donald Trump are, are, are falling to the side, and the American people can focus now on uh, electing the next leader of the of the free world. The ruling the latest legal victory for Trump. The Supreme Court recently ruled in his favor in the presidential immunity case. Those rulings, though, after his conviction in the criminal hush money trial against him, 
and before an attempted assassination on his life during a weekend rally. I'm Clayton Neville. A state court judge's ruling will keep an abortion rights question on the November ballot in South Dakota. The judge dismissed a lawsuit brought by the pro-life group, the Life Defense Fund, that sought to have the question removed even though supporters turned in more than enough valid signatures to put it on the ballot. South Dakota is one of 14 states now enforcing a ban on abortion at every stage of pregnancy, which came after the Supreme Court overturned the Roe v. Wade decision. In a press release, the co-chair of the Life Defense Fund claimed they had evidence showing people were deceived into signing the ballot petition, and they plan to appeal the judge's ruling. When we return on America in the Morning, EVs and hybrid sales jump-started after these messages. America in the Morning continues. The Business Report is brought to you by Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments has a team of specialists in investing, financial planning, estate planning, and more. Learn more at fisherinvestments.com. Investors aren't tiring of the phrase, new records on Wall Street. Here's CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. Wall Street opens this morning after some fresh records yesterday for stocks. The Dow opens at a new record high this morning. The S&P 500 index hit an intraday record yesterday. That Dow, by the way, soared up 250 points. If you have a retirement account with a low-cost S&P 500 index fund in it, it's up 18% for the year so far. The trends are all strong. Strong first halves tend to be followed by strong second halves. The average up year in the S&P is over 20%. We're not quite there yet. So I think all those big picture forces point in in a positive direction. CNBC's Mike Santoli. After the failed assassination attempt on former President Trump over the weekend, gun stocks were higher yesterday. Shares of Smith & Wesson soared 11 percent. Sturm Ruger up 5 percent. Rite Aid confirmed a data breach, compromising some of its customers' personal data, including names, birthdays, and driver's license numbers. It happened last month. Electric vehicles and hybrids are now showing more strength. For car sales, there's greater demand. Both markets showing some strength, growth with hybrids and EVs. Hybrid sales up 15% compared to the first quarter, second quarter to first quarter. Toyota, their hybrid share stands at 48.6%. They are still king of the hill when it comes to hybrids, largely because of how many models that they offer. But Ford is also doing well when it comes to hybrids. And in the EV market, it is still Tesla that leads the market with more than 50% share. But number two, Hyundai, Kia. Then you have Ford, GM, and BMW, which has quietly but effectively been growing its EV sales, coming in at number five. CNBC's Phil LeBeau. Amazon Prime Day's Sale day one is today. It ends tomorrow night. Personal finance experts say shoppers should be careful. Do not fall for potentially misleading marketing and don't give in to impulse buys. Rivals Walmart, Target, Kohl's, the TikTok shop and Timu all launched summer promotions ahead of Amazon. There's a new trend emerging in the cruise industry. Shorter trips. Royal Caribbean's just debuted the Utopia of the Seas, the world's second largest cruise ship sailing out of Florida's Port Canaveral. It's being scheduled for shorter voyages, just three and four days. Over half of our guests are are actually millennials or younger. Um, About 42% of them say in the next 12 months, their plans are, are to actually go on shorter vacation experiences. Royal Caribbean CEO Jason Liberty on CNBC. Utopia holds more than 5,600 passengers, five pools, 21 restaurants, two casinos, and an ice skating rink. On today's watch list, earnings are coming from Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Charles Schwab, J.B. Hunt Transport, and United Health. Thank you, Jessica. CNBC's Jessica Edinger. When we return on America in the Morning, the moon caves after these messages. Welcome back. You're with America in the Morning. Saying the man who was found guilty of torturing and killing two Alaska women treated his victims as horribly as anyone could be treated, a judge sentenced Brian Stephen Smith to a total of 226 years in prison. 
Smith, who showed no emotion to the judge's decision, was arrested in 2019 after a sex worker who stole his cell phone found gruesome images and videos showing the victims being tortured and killed. In Alaska, sentencing for first-degree murder ranges from 30 to 99 years. Again, the sentence here, 226 years in prison. America in the Morning continues. When astronauts head to the moon and possibly stay there for long periods, their first home may be inside a newly discovered cave. Sue Aller explains. Recently, an Italian-led team of scientists have confirmed that lunar caves do exist. In fact, it's located at the Sea of Tranquility, which is just 250 miles from where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed 55 years ago during their Apollo 11 mission. Researchers say evidence was found and analyzed from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to confirm the existence of this underground and undiscovered world. They also say what they found is probably just one of hundreds of hidden caves. They also say these lunar caves could serve as a natural shelter for future astronauts, protecting them from cosmic rays and solar radiation. Having knowledge of the moon's volcanic history can also help scientists better understand how the moon evolved. I'm Sue Aller. America in the Morning for Tuesday, July 16th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay. Our senior producer is Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. Coming up this half hour... Delegates officially nominated Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. I'm Jackie Quinn. We'll have the latest on the investigation into the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. The Secret Service says it's confident this week's Republican National Convention will be safe. Sagar Magani at the White House. Power outages in Texas, the threat of severe weather in the Midwest, and potential flooding in parts of the Northeast. I'm Clayton Neville. China and Russia have begun joint naval drills at a military port in southern China. I'm Karen Chamas. Swifties are looking for hidden meaning in an instrument malfunction during the Eras Tour. I'm Kevin Carr. Back after these messages. Cool down for areas of the country. Welcome back to America in the Morning with the National Forecast today. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. In the wake of a frontal system, there will be a press of much more comfortable weather in the way of lower humidity and considerably lower temperatures across the northern plains. Some highs in northern Minnesota will stay in the 60s with 70s and lower 80s widespread. There could also be a shower, but most places will be rain-free. The same system will be expansive, extending from the Great Lakes through the northeast. It'll be producing heavy, gusty thunderstorms out ahead of it early this morning, even in parts of Illinois and Indiana. These storms have already had a history of producing gusts over 90 miles per hour and even a tornado. The main concern for the day will be over southern Illinois into southern Indiana and Ohio before continuing into northern Kentucky this afternoon and eastward to western Pennsylvania and central New York. These storms will still produce damaging winds, hail, flash flooding, and even an isolated tornado. Scattered thunderstorms will also form farther west along this same system through portions of northern Missouri into Nebraska and Kansas, a few of which could become gusty. Another area of heavier thunderstorms will also develop in the front range of the Rockies from Wyoming into Colorado and then expand into parts of western Nebraska and Kansas late today and tonight. These storms could contain gusty winds and cause flash flooding. Out ahead of the system, it is still going to be hot and humid. We are once again going to see 90s and 100s from the southern plains into the southeast and then continuing into the Tennessee Valley, Middle Atlantic, and the coastal northeast. AccuWeather real field temperatures could be close to 110. Some relief may be felt in the southeast where scattered afternoon thunderstorms could develop and provide de uh, briefly cooler conditions. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. You can follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout.
The RNC convention underway just two days after an assassination attempt on the GOP nominee for president. And one of the first orders of the event was to officially nominate Donald Trump for president, who announced he would select Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his vice presidential running mate. As correspondent Jackie Quinn reports, day one was complete with speeches touting failures of the current administration and the hopes of what a Donald Trump J.D. Vance ticket can do for the American. American people. The Democrats ripped open our borders and allowed millions of illegal aliens to pour in, driving up the cost of housing and health care while slashing American wages and eliminating jobs. They claim that our economy is thriving, yet hundreds of thousands of American-born workers lost their jobs these past few years. The Democrats' economy is of, by, and for illegal aliens. GOP delegates on their first day in Milwaukee officially nominated Donald Trump. On behalf of the 125 delegates in the unbelievable state of Florida, we hereby nominate every single one of them for the greatest president that's ever lived, and that's Donald J. Trump. Hereby declaring him the Republican nominee for president of the United States of America. And now his running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. Are we ready to nominate a vice president? The lieutenant governor of Ohio presenting his state's junior U.S. Senator, J.D. Vance, to the convention. A man who loves America and will represent our people with moral courage. Vance swept to national prominence with his hillbilly elegy memoir and opposed Donald Trump in 2016, but changed his position and was rewarded with a Trump endorsement when he ran for Senate in 2022. I have absolutely got to thank the 45th the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, ladies and gentlemen. Now he and Trump had their party's ticket, announced by House Speaker Mike Johnson. Pursuant to Rule 40D of the rules of the Republican Party, I formally declare President Donald J. Trump and J.D. Vance as the Republican nominees for President and Vice President of the United States. I'm Jackie Quinn. More is being learned about the 20-year-old who attempted to assassinate former President Trump and how police initially responded to the threat. Those details from correspondent Julie Walker. We are investigating this as, a, as an assassination attempt, but also looking at it as a, a potential domestic terrorism act. Butler County Sheriff Michael Sloop says officers had a photo of someone deemed suspicious and were following up. Early on, uh, there was a uh, picture that was provided uh, to law enforcement, and all they were looking for was to identify a suspicious person. Uh, no gun at that time, and the police responded right away. Um, so timing is everything. Uh, they get there, uh, couldn't find him. He says initial reports did not have him on the roof, but they were led there. An officer was hoisted up and saw the gunman, identified as Thomas Crooks, who turned on him. The uh, officer was assisted up to the roof, um, and the shooter had sensed him, heard him, I don't know, uh, but turned, and the officer saved his own life, right? Releases, falls to the ground, and again, what I understand is got on the radio and, and said, gun, gun. The sheriff says there's no way the officer could have confronted the shooter. Anybody tries to go after the officers on scene at AGR and their, their tactics and how they did and what they did, you know, obviously I would challenge them to be in that same position. Um, if they had any training whatsoever, I think they would have done exactly what those police officers did on scene. And if somebody aims a gun at you, you're either going to run for cover uh, or conceal. And he couldn't do either right there except for let go, drop to the ground, and communicate what he knew right then and there via the radio. The sheriff says he was not made aware of any potential threats. Snipers killed crooks, but not before he was able to kill one attendee, injure others, and make an attempt on Trump, who says a bullet pierced his ear. He sat by himself, didn't talk to anyone, like didn't even try to make conversation. So it was just kind of odd. Um, he was an odd kid, but I didn't like have any issues with them or anything. I was shocked because knowing that he lived so close to me that he did something like that, it's just, it's, it's shocking. I'm Julie Walker. 
Away from the arena hosting the RNC convention, there were throngs of protesters denouncing the former president and what they claim to be the GOP agenda. All of this creating extra concerns for safety following the assassination attempt against Donald Trump just two days before. Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports on security at the Republican National Convention. Director Kim Cheadle says the security plans in Milwaukee are designed to be flexible and the agency will change things as needed to keep attendees safe. Cheadle was among top officials updating President Biden on the Trump attack investigation. Milwaukee Mayor Cavalier Johnson says he knows there will be questions about whether the city is safe, but notes the convention has the government's highest possible security level. This event is an NSSE, a national special security event. Uh, by definition, it is an event that has a higher security designation than what the rally uh, that was held in Pennsylvania was. was. So um, the Secret Service, along with the Milwaukee Police Department, have been working for months and months and months, uh, 18 months in total. Sagar Magani at the White House. As security is ramped up in Milwaukee, President Joe Biden has directed the U.S. Secret Service to protect independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and security will be beefed up now for Trump's VP choice, J.D. Vance, as well as for the current president and vice president. A wider buffer zone has been established around the White House. Kennedy's uncle, President John F. Kennedy, and his father, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, were both assassinated in the 1960s. When we return, getting schooled from California Governor Gavin Newsom and Prime Day has arrived. Tech correspondent Chuck Palm has some deals after these messages. I'm John Trout. Welcome back to America in the Morning. Depending upon where you are in America, you could be dealing with record-breaking heat or potential severe weather impacting much of the country today. While some have concerns of flooding and many Texans still without power, correspondent Clayton Neville has the latest. Heat alerts in place for millions of Americans today. More than two dozen deaths associated with a recent heat wave that was especially felt in parts of the West. The heat this week impacting parts of New England into the Southeast. In Texas, well over a week after Hurricane Barrel knocked out power to millions in the Houston area, thousands still in the dark today. If, if you are without power and the extreme heat that we are facing, that alone can cause challenges. But also it reduces your access to uh, food in your apartment or your house, water wherever you may live or wherever you may need it, ice and other things like that. We will continue to provide water and ice for anybody or any community that needs ice. Texas Governor Greg Abbott says the state's also providing meals for those who need them. Another thing that is needed under these scenarios is shelter. If you're without power, many people will need shelter. There are a lot of people impacted by this storm that actually were already in shelters in the aftermath of the derecho, who remain in shelters. Uh, there are about 40, more than 40,000 people who were impacted by derecho that were already in shelters. Centerpoint Energy taking the brunt of the blame for the long wait for power to come on in Texas. In fact, the Texas Public Utility Commission now investigating the company for things like storm preparedness and other potential failures. Thomas Gleason is the PUC chair. We'll have recommendations around their communication, best practices for communicating in an emergency event that they failed to meet. Those can be implemented immediately once we identify them and come up with solutions. Some other issues are going to take longer. So one of the things that I've heard as chairman is vegetation management has been an issue. As Texas waits for the lights to come on, other parts of the country are bracing for the chance of severe weather, possible tornadoes in the forecast in the Midwest, and heavy rain and flooding possible from Pittsburgh to New York. I'm Clayton Neville. California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a first-in-the-nation law barring school districts from passing policies that require schools to notify parents if their child asks to change their gender identification. The law bans rules requiring school staff to disclose a student's gender identity or sexual orientation to any other person without the child's permission. 
Proponents of the legislation say it will help protect LGBTQ plus students who live in what are deemed as unwelcoming households, but opponents say it will hinder schools' ability to be more transparent with parents. In California's Anderson Union High School District, the board approved a parental notification policy last year, but the teachers' union recommended that teachers not enforce the rule. America in the Morning continues. The United States is keeping a watchful eye on joint naval drills now being conducted between Russia and China. Correspondent Karen Shamas reports. The exercise comes just days after NATO accused China of enabling the war in Ukraine because of its support for Russia. The Chinese Defense Ministry said in a brief statement that the operation had nothing to do with international and regional situations and didn't target any third party. The joint drills, which began in Guangdong province, are expected to last until mid-July. China's state TV said the drills are aimed at demonstrating the capabilities of the navies in addressing security threats and preserving peace and stability globally and regionally. I'm Karen Shamas. Well, Amazon Prime Day happens twice a year or so, and tech correspondent Chuck Palm has put together a top five list of deals on tech gadgets you can find today if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber. It's Amazon Prime Day the biannual random day event, usually lasting 48 hours, where Amazon treats its Prime members to special deals. And once again, we've gathered the top five tech deals for you on Amazon Prime. Coming in at number five for $359, the 43-inch Omni QLED Amazon Fire TV, the UHD Smart TV with hands-free Amazon Alexa built in. Number four, Amazon Fire TV Soundbar 2.0 speaker with virtual Dolby Audio Bluetooth connectivity for $90. Number three, the Amazon Fire TV Stick, Mac streaming device, Wi-Fi 6E, only $35. Number two, Anchor Soundcore Space A40 noise-canceling earbuds. And number one, Amazon Prime Deal, the Blink Mini 2 plug-in smart security camera, two-pack for $40. Find the links at allthetoptech.tech. I'm Chuck Palm. Tuesday Sports is in. Here's our Robert Workman. Baseball is at the All-Star break. Teoscar Hernandez of the Dodgers edged the Royals' Bobby Witt Jr. last night to win the Home Run Derby at Globe Life Field in Arlington, Texas. It feels great. Uh, I was trying to haul up all my emotions, you know, but... Uh... You know, feels great. Hernandez is the first Dodger to win the Derby. Same bat place tonight for the MLB All-Star Game. Rookie sensation Paul Skeens, the top pick in the draft by the Pirates just a year ago, will start for the National League. Orioles ace Corbin Burns takes the ball for the American League. The NL won last year's Midsummer Classic in Seattle. That snapped a nine-game AL winning streak. Baseball's draft continued on Monday with rounds three through ten, highlighted by the Yankees' fifth-round choice, Grayson Carter, a right-hander from Vanderbilt who has hit one 103 miles an hour on the radar gun. Also, Angels sixth rounder Peyton Olenek. He's a six foot 11 right hander from Miami who, if he makes it to the bigs, would join John Rauch and Sean Jelly as the tallest players in Major League history. And then there's outfielder Joseph Sullivan, taken by the Astros in the seventh round out of South Alabama. His grandfather was Pat Sullivan, who won the Heisman Trophy as Auburn's quarterback in 1971. The final 10 rounds will be today. Soccer tonight in D.C. The the U.S. women have a friendly with Costa Rica, their last tune-up before the 2024 Olympics begin in Paris next week. That's Tuesday Sports. Thank you, Robert. When we return, Swifties trying to shake off the latest conspiracy theory when America in the Morning continues after these messages. Welcome back here with America in the Morning. Actor James Sicking, who had starring roles in TV shows including Hill Street Blues and Doogie Howser, M.D., has passed away. Correspondent Margie Zaraleta has details. Our objective is the Hard Street Playground. Now, this is a formidable playground, but uh, by no means an impregnable one. 
I plan to deploy you much in the same way Hannibal deployed his Nubians when taking the seawall at Syracuse. James Sicking based his performance of SWAT leader Howard Hunter on Hill Street Blues on a drill instructor he had in basic training. He won an Emmy for the role in 1984. Sicking said in a 1991 AP interview for years he'd be recognized in cities where Hill Street Blues was airing in reruns. You can always tell a uh, cabbie looks at you in the mirror and goes, hey... Howard, what are you doing here? Sicking also was known for playing Doogie Howser's dad on Doogie Howser, M.D. He also had roles in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, Fever Pitch, and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Someone got on, and there was a young boy, I was nine, nine years old, maybe 11 years old, and he looked in the elevator and he said, Oh, look, it's Mr. Hauser. And just as the elevator doors were closing, you could hear the mother off stage saying, Dr. Hauser. <laughs> I'm Archie Zaroleta. We've all heard about conspiracy theories when it comes to politics, but as Kevin Carr reports, fans of Taylor Swift are wondering if there's a new song, Deep Fake, when it comes to a recent concert she gave overseas. If you haven't gotten your fill of conspiracy theories surrounding major public events this week, even Taylor Swift fans are not beyond searching for hidden meaning. During her concert in Milan on Sunday, the Grammy winner's piano, which has traveled the world with her, malfunctioned. She joked about it on stage, as heard in this video from Swifty Tonight on TikTok. You know what? We finally broke it. We have finally broken this thing. When a crew member came on stage to help fix it, some fans heard audible hissing come from the instrument. Moments later, the piano was fixed and Swift went on with the show. It is likely the hissing sound was the singer stifling laughter. However, Swifties have been buzzing about a deeper meaning. Swift has dropped Easter eggs in concerts, videos, and promotions before, so some fans speculate this is telegraphing the upcoming Taylor's version of her album Reputation. I don't like your little games, don't. The album is filled with snake imagery, which has been around since her high-profile online feud with Kim Kardashian in 2017. And with today being World Snake Day, maybe there's something to it. Or maybe, like so many other conspiracy theories out there, it's just a coincidence. I'm Kevin Carr. That's our show for today, America in the Morning. For Tuesday, July 16th, 2024, it's produced by Jeff McKay. Senior producer, Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One.